Hey, everybody. So I'm sure you heard the news that last night Donald Trump and his minions did probably the most racist and hateful rally any major party candidate for president has done for sure in my lifetime. And it was at Madison Square Garden in New York City. So I wanted to do a video talking about it, but I realized I just talked about this in a way that might be really helpful to people. I released a video on this topic a couple weeks ago called Christians Don't Belong at Hate Rallies. And that's a section from my book, A Christian Case Against Donald Trump. So I'm just going to repost that video here because rather than just going off in anger about what happened last night, I thought it might be helpful to do some more biblical teaching about this and to just repeat this message about why this is wrong and why Christians shouldn't be part of it. And I know some of you will be frustrated with, especially in light of what happened last night, you're going to be frustrated with sort of the kid gloves that I might use in, the, in this video, uh, with the way that I treat Trump's supporters who are at the rally, where I say, I don't think they're attracted by the hate. I think it's just part of what what happens there, but they need to not participate in it. And I think I might be close to amending my views on that, uh, but I still want to hold charitable views towards most of Trump supporters. I think if you went to that rally last night, though, I think you kind of knew what you were getting before you went. And they sure seemed to like it when it happened. So that's the only caveat I want to give to some of the gentle treatment I give to Trump supporters in this video. But with that said, uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna play this video, and then for those who are following this series, uh, just you know, tonight I'll be releasing the second to the last video excerpt from A Christian Case Against Donald Trump, and then tomorrow night I'll be releasing the final excerpt from it. So we'll be done with with that entire project. So thanks for listening, and, and here's that video. Hey everybody. So today I'm continuing on with chapter two of my Christian case against Donald Trump, and I'll post a link to the book on Amazon below. Chapter two is called The Way of Peace versus The Way of the Demagogue, and today's excerpt might be the most important part of that chapter. I say that because I'm talking about how Donald Trump's entire strategy is to stir up the worst impulses in his followers, to drive fear and hatred in the country for political purposes. But in this section, I'm trying to make it very clear that I think most of Trump's supporters are better than that. They deserve a candidate who doesn't play to their worst natures. And I don't excuse anyone who gives in to the temptation that Trump offers to kind of wallow around in the muck with him. But I also don't want to be throwing stones at people who are, I think, just being taken advantage of. So anyway, this excerpt starts out with a word about hate in politics. And then I'm going to tell the story of how I got kicked out of a Trump rally in Minneapolis. And I haven't told the story on this channel, so that'll be fun. So, all right, let's jump into this. A word about hate in politics. I call Trump's political events hate rallies because he designs them specifically to stir up hatred and disgust and fear in his audience. I'm not accusing Trump's followers of hatred, though, but I'm warning everyone who listens to him, whether we support him or oppose him, that stirring up our hatred is his goal. Whether we choose to go along or not, he's trying to incite his listeners to hatred as a political strategy. Now, I struggle to properly address Trump's strategic use of hatred because the conversation quickly takes on a both sides dynamic. So yes, extremists of every type have long fomented hatred in their followers, and we must resist all those appeals. But Trump has taken that strategy mainstream in a way that no other presidential candidate has attempted, at least in my lifetime. So because of my efforts against the MAGA movement, People often accuse me of hating Trump myself, and this may be their own projection, but it's worth talking about. We can all do better at confronting bullies without falling over the edge into hatred. 
So toward that end, I'll describe my own struggle as transparently as I can. I do oppose Trump's tactics. I do find his demagogic rhetoric to be dangerous in a man who seeks the presidency. And if I wanted to appear more spiritual than I am, I could just end my comments at that point. But it wouldn't be authentic because on a personal level, I am repelled by the things that he reveals about his character every day. So the following statements are not unfair judgments about Trump. They're based on observable, established facts. Christians make a mockery of our discernment when we deny these things or when we accuse people of judgmentalism for calling attention to these realities. So Donald Trump uses abusive, bullying speech every day. He sexually degrades women with his words. He's been proven in court to have sexually abused at least one woman, and he's been credibly accused by many more. He's been proven in multiple courts to have committed serial acts of fraud. In his selfish pursuit of power and wealth, he's brought division to our nation and immense suffering to individuals. He orchestrated a months-long campaign of inflammatory lies about the 2020 election that led to an assault on the Capitol, an assault in which people died. He continues to spread those same lies, and he's preemptively begun to lie about the upcoming election. And in all these things, he blasphemes the name of Jesus by claiming to speak for Jesus' followers. I'll put this next one in its own paragraph, since this one is a personal opinion. I find Trump's combination of breathtaking ignorance and entirely unmerited self-regard profoundly objectionable. In short, I wouldn't walk across the street to have a Diet Coke with Donald Trump. And I'm disappointed by people who accept his unrepentant return to society and politics as somehow legitimate. I'm disillusioned by the widespread acceptance by Christians of so many things that we found utterly unacceptable just a few years ago. But if Trump were thirsty, I'd give him water. If he were hungry, I'd give him food. I don't hate Donald Trump. I have no desire to see him suffer. I want him to quit manipulating people of faith and quit abusing our nation in Jesus' name. I want to see his heretical movement defeated, rejected by voters, and repudiated by history. And when it comes to his criminality, I want our justice system to deal with him fairly and impartially in the coming years. He deserves the same rights and privileges as any citizen before the law. My introduction to politics came through my work in the pro-life movement long before I entered pastoral ministry. And I hold a core belief about human life. Every one of us bears the image of God. I dare not hate the image of God in any human being. So even as I do this critical work of warning Christians about him, and even though I personally dislike what he's revealed to us about his character, I honor the image of God in Donald Trump. Christians don't belong at hate rallies. And just as I don't appreciate being accused of hatred myself, I don't want to unfairly accuse Trump supporters of hatred. I'm quite critical of the choice Christians make to participate in Trump's rallies, but I don't believe they themselves are primarily motivated by hate. I assume their motivations run the gamut from enjoying a good time with like-minded friends to genuinely wanting to support a movement that they believe will take our country in a better direction. I've been thinking about this a lot since the brutal attack on Trump and his audience in Pennsylvania. I grieve for the people at that rally who were killed or wounded. I don't know them, but... When I heard about them, I remembered my own experience at a Trump rally in Minneapolis in October of 2019. I spent several hours that day with people who could have been my neighbors, my family members, part of my church. And even though I disagreed with them, I didn't dislike them. Until that day in 2019, I hadn't spoken publicly about Trump. Since retiring from ministry in 2016, 
I had only shared my concerns privately with friends and family, but Trump's aggressive appeals to Christians, combined with the very public backing that he received from prominent Christian leaders, eventually pushed me over the edge. I decided that Trump's visit to Minneapolis would be my coming out party as a vocal opponent of the Trumpian heresy. I assumed people from my church might be at the rally, so I put on one of my favorite hats and a black shirt. It's this black shirt here that I, that I used to always wear for preaching because I wanted them to recognize me. I wanted them to recognize me when I loudly voiced my opposition inside the arena. As their former pastor, I wanted them to know that I disagreed with Trump's appeals to their worst nature. But other than that, I had no specific plan. I get nervous around people, believe it or not, which was always a bit of a liability as a pastor. And I especially don't like drawing negative attention to myself. Hard to believe with this YouTube channel, but I don't like drawing negative attention to myself. So I decided just not to think about it until I got inside the stadium. I know Trump seems dissipated now, a late career Elvis, but he was a big deal in 2019 the 45th president of the United States of America. So people wanted to see him. So I showed up early, but it turned out I wasn't nearly early enough. The line of rally goers behind the Target Center already wrapped back and forth and in upon itself intestinally, then back out and several blocks down the street. And I knew I was just never gonna get inside. So instead, I chose to perform an object lesson for the people in line. I gathered my courage, and I took a couple of deep, calming breaths. Then I cut in line in the most like obvious and non-subtle fashion that I could. I just brazenly skipped ahead of a few thousand people. And the folks behind me, who you'll remember, had come to celebrate Donald Trump, somehow found my action morally offensive, ethically repugnant, and quite possibly sinful. They murmured among themselves about what to do with me. So soon they appointed a spokesperson. I heard his voice behind me. Can we help you? And I waited for him to ask a couple more times, a bit louder with each repetition. And then I turned to face him and his friends. And I, I feigned surprise. Oh, me? Now this might all sound kind of strange if you're not from Minnesota, but around here we call this doing conflict. So he looked like every guy I've ever played softball with on a church league. He looked like every guy I've ever rocked out with at a music festival or stood beside in the Pronto Pup line at the Minnesota State Fair. Not a monster, not a hater, just a good dude. I learned later that he and his friends and family came to the rally because they'd never seen a president of the United States in the flesh before. He wore a t-shirt from a rural Minnesota fire department. I thought about him recently when I learned that the man who lost his life in the Trump rally shooting in Pennsylvania had also been a firefighter. I admire and respect anyone who serves in that kind of a profession. I understood why the crowd chose this guy to confront me. I would have chosen him too. He said, sir, you just cut in line. Oh, I replied, yes. You just cut in line in front of thousands of people. He seemed a little exasperated that my transgression was less obvious to me than it was to him. Oh, that. I smiled as innocently as I could. That's no problem. I learned from my president that the rules don't apply anymore. Cutting in line isn't against the law. It's just a norm. I'm not breaking a law. I'm only breaking a norm. The people stared at me, and I smiled and blinked for a while. And they discussed what I'd said and begrudgingly acknowledged that I'd made a solid point. So they let me stay. And then after the initial tension wore off, I got to know a bit about these folks. They weren't especially political. And if I'd wanted to, I could have debated some of the finer points of their support for Trump. But mostly I listened while they talked to each other. It felt exactly like one of my family reunions, except... I showed more restraint than I typically do with my own family. But once inside the arena, I made my way directly behind the stage, but in the upper deck above the view of the cameras. 
And I sat and watched the preliminary propaganda, including some disturbingly bigoted attacks against my fellow Minnesotan, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. I studied the people around me. For the most part, they seemed bored and low energy, but we'd all been standing in the sun for hours to get in. I think the true believers must have been down on the main floor because the folks with me up in the nosebleed section mostly were just waiting silently through the warm-up acts. And Mike Pence spoke before Trump. It was somewhat unusual to have Trump and Pence at the same rally, but they thought that they had a shot at winning Minnesota in 2020, so they went all in. Pence's speech bothered me far more than anything else I heard that day because he so willingly leveraged his position as a public Christian to sell the crowd on Donald Trump in the name of Jesus. As he spoke, I kept thinking about the conservative columnist George Will. George is right, I thought to myself. Oleaginous. The word is oleaginous. For the record, I'm glad that Mike Pence did the right thing on January 6, 2021, and I'm glad that he's refusing to endorse Trump this time around. It's a decent start, but his approval rating remains underwater with me. His speech that night was one of many endorsements he gave Trump over the years. And I've yet to hear him admit that for four years, in service to his own ambition, he knowingly slathered Donald Trump with a thick Jesus sheen. As the most prominent follower of Christ in the Trump administration, Mike Pence did far more damage to the Christian conscience than Trump ever could. And by the time the Lee Greenwood song started playing and Trump took the stage, I felt more than ready to say my piece and leave. And I didn't want to do it, but I knew that this act was far more important for me myself than for anyone who might hear me. As futile as it may seem, it felt almost sacramental, almost like a baptism into my public opposition to Trump. I knew Trump was dangerous. I knew he was leading followers of Jesus over a spiritual cliff. I knew that the hateful words being spoken at that rally directly repudiated the way of Jesus. And more than anything, I knew that Christians didn't belong in that arena. So I stood and I walked down the concrete steps way up among the rows of crowded seats down to the upper deck railing directly behind the president. I turned and looked back at the crowd above me who were starting to notice me and then I scanned for the nearest security guard. I made eye contact with him and nodded to like give him the heads up. I wanted him to get to me before the crowd. Then I took another calming breath and climbed over the railing and out onto a small platform above the crowd. The security guard motioned for me to get back and I just gave him a friendly wave and then he started towards me. So I waited a beat for Trump's next pause. Then I cut my hands to my mouth and I yelled some rather dumb stuff like, you're a liar, you're a criminal. It was neither the time nor the place for a nuanced discussion. <laughs> and as the words left my mouth, they just disappeared into that cavernous hall. Like in the video of Trump's speech that day, I can recognize the moment because I hear my voice just faint, quite faint. And I see the people directly behind Trump crane their necks to watch the disturbance. But to me, it felt like a bad dream where I'm trying to desperately get someone's attention, but my words come out muffled and garbled and incoherent. So when the security guard came to fetch me, I went along willingly, but I did turn to face the crowd above me, hundreds of whom were shouting their displeasure and booing my performance. I didn't feel bad for them. I knew that I'd given them the most truth and probably the most excitement that they'd experienced that day. So I smiled broadly and I threw my arms out in an are you not entertained gesture. And then I followed security down to the bowels of the target center to talk to the police. I wanted so badly to get arrested, but since I really hadn't done anything more than speak out of turn, they simply wrote down my information and took my photo. Then they warned me that from here on out, I'm forever banned from Trump rallies. The sheriff's deputy who drove me out of the security perimeter on a golf cart asked me what I'd done. 
I said, I told the truth to the President of the United States, but in a rather unkind manner. He smiled and said, at his own party? As I stepped through the final gate, I turned back to him and asked, wait, am I kicked out of all the targets or just the target center? What? Have you seen O Brother Where Art Thou? No, I haven't. Oh, okay, never mind. You should watch it, then you'll agree I just said something really funny. I tell that story partly because this book could use some levity, but mostly I tell it because I believe with all my heart that the majority of Trump supporters are better than Trump, and they're better than a Trump rally. They don't belong in that environment. It's intentionally designed to appeal to their worst nature. For myself, I decided from then on to quit screaming into the void. Instead, I would devote myself to making a coherent case against Donald Trump to any believers who are willing to listen. This book is just one more step in the direction I chose that night. All right, so as usual, if you like this video, please share it with somebody. And if you buy the book, please leave a review for it on Amazon. And thanks for listening.